you for inviting me to share with you this beautiful presentation. To me, it is beautiful because it is a topic that I dearly love since I was a child. Uh, I fell in love with Holy Week. I, I, I recall very clearly uh, the oldest, well, the first Holy Week that I remember was when I was four years old. I perfectly remember the spot where my mom parked her Volkswagen and then walked my sister and me into the church with one of my aunts. I perfectly recall that and then I recall everything that happened. And I was only four and there was something in, in Holy Week that grasped my attention. Then I started to grow and I didn't pay too much attention to it. But when I was 10 years old, two things happened that changed my perception about Holy Week forever. One was that I had the blessing of sitting next to my grandmother and she was carrying a misa with her. And uh, she let me see through the misa and then I realized that the misa contained not only the readings that were being read in the different liturgies, but they also noticed that they had some notes in red ink that said exactly what the priest was doing and how he was moving and how he was extending his arms and everything. So then I started anticipating myself, trying to see if the priest was going to do what the missile said, and indeed he did. So then I realized that the Mass and the liturgies are not something casual and random, but something that is supposed to be done or is meant to be done in a specific order. And I figured that there was a reason behind that. So that made me fall in love with liturgy in a very special way. And I promised myself that when I grew up, I would have my own missile and I would carry my missile to Mass every Sunday, and I do. So one of my passions is sacred liturgy. And then something else happened that same year when I was 10. It was the celebration of the Paschal Vigil, and my mom had a, a migraine attack, so she couldn't come with us. So she stayed at home with my two younger sisters, and I went to Mass with my dad, with my, with my other sister, and, 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 and it was only the three of us. And it was the first time my dad took us to the Paschal Vigil. Probably he didn't take us before because we were too young. You know it is a long Mass and it is late at night. But back in Mexico, in Holy Week, the churches are really crowded, really, really crowded. And our parish was really big. On Christmas and uh, on New Year and on Holy Week, it easily seats a thousand people. And uh, it is not only the people sitting in the pews, but also the people standing around the church because there's not enough pews for them. So we were, we were little and we couldn't see anything. And we're, we were in the middle of the crowd. And my dad was smart enough to sneak into the stairwell that conducted upstairs to the choir. So I could see all the celebration of that majestic mass from atop, seeing the big crowd, and seeing it, it was a, it was a, a parish run by, by Franciscan priests. So it was a concelebrated mass, and there were like five priests on the altar. And next to us, there was a Franciscan friar with his Franciscan habit sitting at the organ and three ladies singing next to him. And I just fell in love forever with the Pascal Vigil. So even though I was 10, I started to look forward to the celebration of Holy Week year after year. It was something very special to me. And because of that, I didn't content myself with just going to Mass and reading what the Missal said. I had to learn more and I had to learn what was behind. And the more I studied about the liturgies of Holy Week, the more I realized that that is the core of our faith, and that is what makes our faith to be meaningful. Because what we celebrate in those, in those liturgies, in the end, is the mystery of our redemption, and it is the mystery of the supreme love God has for us. So that's why I decided one day to put together this talk, Understanding, Celebrating, and Living the Paschal Triduum, and that's what I want to share with you tonight. Thank you for coming. My name is Mauricio Perez, and uh, I am a journalist 
I, I graduated from the, universe, from the uh, Gregorian University in Rome. What are you seeing? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a Catholic radio program. I've been on the air for 12 years. It is, it is broadcast by uh, about 25 stations in 10 countries every day. Um, it, it is in Spanish though, otherwise I would share it with you. The people who speak Spanish probably you have heard it. It is called Semillas para la Vida. And uh, I, I, I have been a Vatican analyst also for the TV in Mexico. And currently I am the editor and writer of the Spanish section of Northwest Catholic magazine. Uh, I also collaborate with Catholic.net in the Ask the Experts Forum, and my specialty is, of course, sacred liturgy, so that's what I do. And, uh, well, on my spare time, I raise a family, and I work for F5 Networks, right? So that's something that, that I do for a living, and uh, so anyway, so I'm here tonight to share all this with you. Uh, I was originally invited by Marco to speak in Spanish, but then he told me that the invitation was extended to the full parish, so he asked me to give the presentation in English, but to take questions in English and in Spanish. So if you have any question at some point, feel free to make the question in Spanish, and I will uh, answer in English and in Spanish, if I know the answer. If not, then I'm sorry, but I, I won't give in any language, okay? So, this talk is not only meant for you to learn. This talk is meant to get you ready for what we are going to experience in Holy Week, and more specifically, the Pascal Triduum. This is a talk that I normally give on Wednesday in Holy Week, just in preparation, direct preparation to the Triduum. Now we are, uh, we are doing it here before Holy Week begins. But the focus will be only the Pascal Triduum. Um, so to get ready, we don't only have to learn, we have to reflect about what we are going to see tonight. And it is important to prepare our spirits even for that. So I would like to begin with a prayer. And I would like to ask, to ask you to close your eyes for a moment. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, after the long journey, we have arrived in Jerusalem. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, and with His light, allow us to appreciate the sacrifice we have undergone for our salvation. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, and with His love, allow us to experience the immense love that we need to undergo this sacrifice for our salvation. May the words we hear tonight Help us to feel more close to your presence in our life. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> so we're about to, 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 to begin the celebration of Holy Week. And uh, it is interesting to know a few things. Well, first of all, Holy Week, uh, this coming Sunday, we're going to celebrate Palm Sunday of the Lord's Passion. That is the name. Palm Sunday of the Lord's Passion. Lent is not over yet. <laughs> Holy Week will begin, but we will still be living in Lent for a few more days. And on Palm Sunday, we celebrate the glorious and triumphant entrance to Jerusalem by Jesus. And uh, we are going to process with palms and uh, then we're going to read a lengthy gospel reading that will tell us the passion according to Mark. And the reason for that is that we are in liturgical, in liturgical year B, cycle B. So in cycle B we focus on Mark mainly. So this year we're going to read the, the passion according to Mark. And then we will continue living Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday in Holy Week, but still in Lent. And then it's going to end, it will come to an end on Holy Thursday and being precise, it will end on Holy Thursday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Because then at 5 o'clock, that is when the Vigil begins and that is when the liturgical celebration begins at the Vigil. So 
when we begin, when we celebrate the evening mass of the Lord's Supper, that is when, when, when the triduum starts, and that is when, you know, Lent is behind. Lent is behind. And uh, we have journeyed through the desert, through the Lenten desert for 40 days, for two reasons. We have two purposes, and we prepare ourselves for two things. One thing is to celebrate the mystery of the passion, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. That is the Paschal mystery. That is the mystery of our salvation, the mystery of redemption. That is the first thing we prepare ourselves in Lent. The second thing we prepare ourselves in Lent, as you well know, is... <laughs> here, here. The second thing we prepare ourselves in Lent for is... Passion, death, and resurrection. Yeah, the, well, Easter is, <laughs> is, is the Pascal mystery, right? <laughs> so, that was the first. But the second, the second thing we prepare ourselves for in Lent is for the renewal of our baptismal promises. That is something really important to know. We don't, so if you, if you didn't know, then you have only lived like half a Lent. Because you have been only preparing yourself for half of the celebration. <laughs> Because the other half is, is the, the renewal of our baptismal promises. Of course, catechumens get ready for their baptism, but we get ready to renew our baptismal promises. And where does that happen? When does that happen? That takes place at the celebration of the Paschal Vigil. Right? And that is why the water that will be blessed is going to be sprinkled on us on the act of penance during the Easter time. You know, the act of penance in Easter time, traditionally the priest walks around the aisles sprinkling everybody with holy water. And that is a continuation of that renewal of our baptismal promises in which we renounce to sin, and we accept God, and we reject Satan. So that's all we do, right? So now you know. So next year, you can take note, and then next year you will remember, and then you get ready for the full thing, and not only for the celebration of, of Easter, because that is only part of it. Now, what we celebrate in the, in the Triduum, and not the Triduum, is one single mystery. It is, it is like a triptych, actually, that unfolds on three different pictures, on three different icons, on three different moments, on three different episodes, but it is a single mystery. And the mystery is the Passion, the Death, and the Resurrection of the Lord. What happens in these three days is the most important thing in our faith, because what happens in these three days is our salvation. That is what takes place in these three days. So we shouldn't take them lightly. This is definitely a big celebration. And everybody should stop whatever they are doing and focus only on these mysteries. And tonight, I want to stress the importance and the sacredness and the holiness of these three days so that you can really appreciate why we call it a holy week and then you devote your life and time, those three days, to the mystery that is unfolding for our salvation. Right? So, uh, a common question is, why the date in which we celebrate Easter moves from year to year? Well, we follow the Jewish tradition of celebrating Passover. They celebrate Passover on the first full moon in spring. And for them, because they, they, they use a, a, a lunar calendar, uh, that is the 14th day of the month of Nisan. And that is when they celebrate Passover, and what they celebrate, I will explain that in detail in a minute. So we celebrate our Passover, which we, in English we call it Easter. I, I have never understood why in English you use two different terms, Easter and Passover, because in the rest of the languages, it is only one term, which is Pascha, which is Passover. So, so the Christian Passover is what we call Easter, but in, in the end it is, it is uh, the Christian Passover, and you will see why in a minute. But in any case, we celebrate that on the first Sunday after the first full moon in spring. And because full moon changes year after year, then that's the reason why Holy Week moves in the calendar year after year. So as I said, the Triduum begins on Holy Thursday evening, or afternoon, with the evening mass of the Lord's Supper. That is when everything begins. 
And uh, this Mass is important because we celebrate three things. Three things. We celebrate the institution of priesthood, the institution of the Eucharist, and Jesus' commandment of love. In, in the account of the Last Supper, in the Gospel according to John, Jesus gives that command to his apostles to love each other as he has loved us. And uh, those three things are so important in this celebration that even the Missal says that the homily must touch on those three points Ooh. so that people are aware of that reality. So the institution of priest, the institution of the Eucharist, and the commandment of law. And how do we celebrate this liturgically, these three events? Well, the first reading has a strong connection with what Jesus is celebrating, because what we are celebrating on this Mass is the Last Supper of Jesus and his 12 apostles. We all know that. But where did that come from? What was Jesus celebrating when he gathered with his 12 apostles in that upper room, in that house that according to the tradition belonged to the mother of Saint Mark, the evangelist? Well, in the first reading that is taken from the book of Exodus, we read the prescriptions that God gave Moses to celebrate the Passover meal. You remember that night after the 10 plagues and the Pharaoh still refusing to let them go. You remember that story, right? So God said, you know, I'm going to send my last play. And finally, the Pharaoh is not only going to let you go, he's going to kick you out. <laughs> because what I'm going to do is that my angel will pass through the city and he will be killing the firstborns in every home but yours. So to celebrate your delivery and to celebrate your freedom, you are going to celebrate this supper with this menu and with these customs, and then you are going to celebrate that year after year after year after year so that you can preserve this celebration alive and that you can partake on that celebration because that is the purpose of that. So even to date, the Jews celebrate the Passover Seder. And what Jesus was celebrating with his 12 apostles according to the Synoptic Gospels was precisely the Passover Seder. So Jesus gathered with his 12 apostles to celebrate this. But he gave a different or new meaning, a definite meaning to that celebration. Yet it is important to understand that Passover celebration so that we can understand what Jesus was up to that night with his 12 apostles. It is a beautiful celebration. It is a, it is a supper, but it is a ritual actually. And it is called seder because in Hebrew that means order. So when we speak about the order of the mass, that goes back to the Passover Seder, which is a, a supper celebrated following a specific order. Remember that I told you that when I saw the Missal of my grandmother, I realized that all the liturgies were celebrated following a specific order that was prescribed in the rubrics in the Missal. Mm. So that's where this comes from. And on this celebration, <coughs> uh, in, in, this, in this supper, it all begins by the, the Benjamin, who is the youngest in the family, asking a question, why is this night different from the rest? And he asks on different times, why is this night different from the rest? And then the eldest gives an answer. And this night is different because, uh, for example, in, uh, and that, that's how the question goes, in the rest of the nights we can eat leavened or unleavened bread, but this night we can only eat unleavened bread, and that was the prescription of God. And. Uh, and not only that, uh, another question is, in the rest of the nights, we eat sitting down, but on this night, we eat leaning, because it was a banquet. So the Jews back then, they would eat sitting down, but on the big banquets, then they would lean. And Jesus was leaning on the, he was reclining on the, on the Last Supper, and we can see that in the Gospel according to John, how the, the beloved disciple was close to him, right? And uh, so, the, so that's the way they did. So today, to symbolize that they are leaning down because it is, a, it is a banquet, they put a pillow below their arm. And with that, they symbolize that they are leaning because it is a banquet, a special, a special celebration, a special occasion. The menu is important, and it was also originally prescribed by God, and then they just added some, some things to the meal 
that were meant to symbolize something, and it is very interesting. First of all, the lamb was the main dish that was prescribed by God. You have to roast a, a lamb and you have to eat it all. There should be no leftovers. And if it is too big for your family, then gather with another family so that you can eat it all. That was the main dish, and keep that in mind because it has a very powerful meaning. Then another dish is uh, the, the bitter herbs, the maror. And the purpose of eating the bitter herbs is to taste the bitterness of slavery when they were slaves back in Egypt. The purpose of this supper is to be an experience. And all these dishes are meant for the people who consume them to experience the feelings and the emotions and the suffering that the ancient people of, of Israel experienced when they were captives in Egypt. And why do they have to experience it precisely to be part of it? How can they be part of that episode in history? They can become part of that episode in history by bringing it into the present and partaking of it by experiencing it. And that is what we call a memorial. What is the Mass? The Mass is a memorial of the Last Supper of Jesus. So with that in mind, the purpose of Mass is not to recall something that happened in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. The purpose is to relieve it, to experience it. The Mass is an experience of God. We go to Mass to experience the presence of God, not to listen to readings and to listen to the priest and then just to receive communion. All that is meant for us to experience the presence of God talking to us, nourishing us in our lives today, here and now. And that concept, that idea of the memorial goes back to the celebration of the Passover Seder. And Jesus was doing that with his disciples. Another important dish here is the haroset. The haroset is a sauce, it is, it is delicious. It is made with crushed apple, and uh, some people uh, pour wine on it, some others pour apple juice, uh, and they, uh, uh, they grind uh, nuts on it, and it is delicious. But the, 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 because of the, uh, well, uh, because of the chemical effect of the wine or the, or the grape juice in contact with the apple, the color and the texture and the consistency it takes reminds them of the clay that they used in Egypt to make the bricks when they were slaves. And that is the purpose of the haroset. And the way you eat the haroset is by dipping, by dipping uh, unleavened bread on it. And let me tell you something. By the way, the people here who, who speak Spanish, I have to share this with you, and I'm sorry. <laughs> So my newest book, available here and in Amazon, <laughs> is on Judas. And, and my newest book, I, it, it was released a month ago, it is called Judas, Traitor or Instrument of God. It is a biblical analysis of, of, of Judas. And uh, we can see something really interesting in the Gospel according to John in the Last Supper. When Jesus announces that someone is going to betray him, then Peter makes a, 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 a gesture to, to the beloved disciple, who was living next to Jesus, to ask him who he was. And Jesus gives him a clue. He, does, he doesn't bring up his name. And Jesus was clever not bringing up his name, because if he did, you know what would happen? Remember how Peter reacted when they, tried to, when they, when they arrested Jesus? He brought out his sword and cut the ear of one of the, of the guardians, of the guards, right? Well, if they had known there that Jesus was a traitor, they would have gone after him. So Jesus was prudent, and he didn't disclose the name, but he gave John a sign. He said, the one that I give a piece of bread deep in the sauce, he is the one who will betray me. So what Jesus did was, he took a piece of unleavened bread, and he dipped it in the haroset, and he gave it to Judas. But the interesting thing about that gesture is that that gesture, according to their traditions, is reserved only for the host of the banquet, and it is also reserved for the guest, the host loves the most. And he gave it to you guys. Isn't that powerful? Ooh. You want to learn more, those who speak Spanish? <laughs> <laughs> those who speak English, you have to wait. <laughs> for next year, for me to write it. But you can read this in the Gospel according to John. But 
this is the kind of things that we that we have to understand because that makes that gives more 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 meaning to, to our faith, right? We, everything begins to make sense. Well, in any case, another important uh, thing they eat is the egg, because there was some period in history in, they, in which they were so poor that they didn't have money to. To, to prepare the, the, the Passover meal and to fulfill the prescription because it is an obligation to do it. So then the religious authorities decided that by eating an egg, they would fulfill, uh, they would fulfill the, the obligation. So, I was telling you that, I don't know why in English you separate Passover from Easter, but they are actually the same word, they are synonyms. So, with that in mind, Easter is the same as Passover. Let's call this Passover Easter for a minute. And what is that? Okay, so now you know where the Easter egg comes from. Right? How about the bunny? <laughs> the bunny is, I think the bunny comes from Europe. I think the bunny comes from Germany. And the purpose of the bunny, uh, it's actually a, a, a rabbit, and I don't remember the, the, the name in English. Well, was that kind of rabbit? It's a liebre. So, so the purpose of that is that, is that it is an animal that, when it's in danger, runs up top the hill very fast. So that running up top the hill was a symbol of the resurrection. That's the that's connection they made about the rabbit. So, as I, as I said, they eat unleavened bread. And that was a prescription of God. And also they had to do it because it had to be quick. It had to be quick, right? They didn't have time to bake. So with the heat there, they could just mix uh, the wheat and, and water and then put it to the sun <laughs> with the heat there, then there is your bread. So that's why they ate unleavened bread. But what do we eat at Mass? Unleavened bread. So the unleavened bread we eat at Mass comes from the unleavened bread that Jesus broke at the Last Supper, which is this unleavened bread, which is called uh, the, the, the maror. The name is, no, the matzah, the matzah, the matzah. In plural, matzot in singular. So that, that's what they eat. And in addition to the unleavened bread, they drink four cups of wine. Four cups of wine. No wonder the apostles fell asleep when they went to get Gethsemane. No, seriously, right? Four cups of wine. And the most important of them is the last cup, which is the cup of blessing. And it is, and it is drunk, it is drunk, Drink, drink, drunk. But how do I say it? Is, it, it is drunk. It is consumed. When the, when the, it is consumed when the, when the supper is over. And it is such an important cup. It is called the cup of blessing. It is so important that all Jewish families, regardless of how rich or how poor they are, they all have at home a precious cup that they only use on this time in the year, and they only, they only use it for this blessing. It is the cup of blessing. It is, it is a beautiful cup. Now, and the purpose of that cup of blessing, it is like toasting for their freedom. The thing is that this cup is consumed when the supper is ended. Jesus, according to the Gospel, when the supper was ended, he took the cup, he blessed it, and then he turned it into his own blood. That cup, as I told you, is like toasting. That blessing cup is meant to be like a toast for their salvation. For the salvation of what? Or from what? From slavery. But in the case of Jesus, he is converting. And see, the thing is that once they were freed from the slavery, they eventually managed to get to Mount Sinai, and there God established a covenant with the people of Israel. What Jesus is doing in the Last Supper is blessing that cup, but not for the liberation of people from slavery, but for liberation of people from sin and from death. Because Jesus is going to redeem us now, and that's why he turns this into his blood. Because with that blood, he is going to seal a new and everlasting covenant, not only with a single nation, but with the, with the entire world for our salvation. So now we know where the, where the chalice comes from. And that's why in our liturgical norms, the chalice used at Mass has to be made of a precious metal, and especially it has to have gold. And if it is not gold, it has to be gilded inside with gold. 
And the reason for that, first, according to following the tradition of the majestic cup, but also because what contains is the blood of God. So we have to use the most precious material we know to hold the blood of God. That's why. So crystal cups are forbidden, actually, in liturgy. Right? And the chalice uh, follows this tradition. Now, when we read the account of the Last Supper, we don't see a reference to the main dish. And the main dish of the Passover so there was what? The lamb. Well, that night, that lamb was very important because God was going to send his angel to the, to the town or to the nation, whatever, to the country, and he was going to kill all the firstborns of every home. But God said, to protect your home and to make my, my angel pass over your home, that's why we call it Passover, to make, to make my angel pass over your home, you have to put a mark on the entrance of your house with the blood of the lamb. So the relevance of that lamb is that on that night, the lamb, the blood of that lamb saved them from death on that night. In the Last Supper, there is no reference to a lamb. Jesus was celebrating the seder, but he gave to it a new and definite meaning. Because in this Last Supper, Jesus, they didn't eat lamb, the roasted lamb, because they actually ate the lamb of God. Because Jesus converted the piece of bread and the cup of wine into his body and into his blood. So when the apostles consumed that, bread, that, that uh, broken bread and drank from that cup of wine, they were actually eating the lamb, but not the Paschal lamb of the ancient times. They were eating the lamb, the definite lamb with a capital L. And with the blood of this lamb, we are going to be saved from death, but from eternal death. And that's why Jesus is the definite Lamb of God, because with his Lamb, we are going to be saved from eternal death. So that is the connection between the Passover Seder and the, the, Holy, and, and the Last Supper and our Holy Mass, you see? That is the connection, and that is the relevance of, of, uh, of the meal and, and the different dishes they eat. They have a meaning, and again, they are meant uh, to be consumed so that people could experience everything that people had to go through during slavery. And that's what we do. We partake on the celebration of, of the Last Supper by Jesus. So when we eat communion, when we, when, we, when we receive communion, we are eating the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, who shed His blood for our salvation. So this is the first reading taken from the book of Exodus. I elaborated all the rituals, so now you understand what, this, what it is talking about. And one of the important parts of it was the blessing cup. Well, in the responsorial psalm, which is meant to answer to God who spoke to us first in the first reading, you know, in the first reading, God talks to us. But Mass is not a monologue of, of, of God. Mass is meant to be a dialogue between God and, and His people. So God takes the initiative, He always takes the initiative, so He talks to us first. But once God has spoken to us, we answer back to Him, and we respond to Him with the responsorial psalm. So the topic of the psalm is always connected to the topic of the first reading, and that's why, that is why the liturgical norms forbid to replace the psalm that appears in the lectionary with any other thing. I, I know that many musicians and liturgical musicians and choirs pick whatever they want, but no, the, the psalm has to, to be the one in the, in the lectionary because it answers to what God told us in the first reading. And in the first reading here, God prescribed the celebration of the Passover, and then in the psalm, which is taken from Psalm 166, we will be saying, our blessing cup is a communion with the blood of Christ. So we are going to, to blend the words of the psalm with what is happening that night in our context now, in the context of the Last Supper, right? And we are going to give that meaning of the communion of love. So that's what we are going to say. Our blessing cup is a communion 
with the blood of Christ. So now you see why we, we, we say that silent and the connection, right? And everything begins to make sense. Then we go to the second reading. I told you that in this Mass we celebrate the institution of the Eucharist and the institution of priesthood. Well, it happened precisely when Jesus instituted the Eucharist. At the same time, he instituted priesthood when he told his disciples, you do the same. I'm giving you the faculty to turn a piece of bread and a cup of wine into my body and my blood, and by that you are becoming priests. So on that last supper, Jesus instituted both the sacrament uh, of, the, of the Eucharist and the, and the sacrament of the, of the Holy Orders. And uh, the account of the Last Supper, or the account of the institution of the Eucharist and the priesthood, is not, uh, is not read in the, in the Gospel, but is read, is read in the second reading, which is taken from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. In the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, he also speaks about the institution of the Eucharist and in consequence the institution of priesthood. So that's what we're going to read in the, in the second reading. And then we go to the Gospel. The Gospel this night is taken from the, from the Last Supper according to John, which is very different than the Last Supper according to the Synoptics. There are many, many differences. And one of them is that John presents the washing of the feet that the Synoptics don't. And that is what we read in the Gospel, the washing of the feet. Because in the Gospel, in the, in the Last Supper according to John, first we see the washing of the feet, then we see how Jesus uh, announces the betrayer, uh, and the traitor, and gives the piece of bread to, 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 to this guy, what's his name? Oh. Judas. <laughs> and, then, and then he dismisses it. He dismisses it and then he goes, right? And then from that point on, we see three, we find three lengthy farewell discourses that we only find in the Last Supper according to John, and from there he goes to Gethsemane. So the account of John is very different than the synoptics. But the, one of the important parts is precisely the washing of the feet. And the washing of the feet is so important that we reenact the washing of the feet. And when I say we, I say we as a church, not necessarily we as the faithful. Because the way this is done is by having the priest, the celebrant priest, washing the feet of some faithful who sit next to the altar. And it is a ritual, this is actually a ritual. Until two years ago, the, the prescription was for the washing of the feet to include men only. Men only. Many people here in the, in the U.S. didn't care, and they used men and women alike. Two years ago, Pope Francis allowed for the use of, for the participation of both men and women in the washing of the feet, provided that the celebrant priest is entitled to, to choosing his preference. <coughs> So you can find a priest who says, following the, the tradition, we are going to have only men. Or he can say, we can have men and women. The liturgical norms do not prescribe a number of participants. So they, the tradition is to have 12, because 12 were the apostles. But there is no number. However, the way, what it does prescribe is the way it has to be done. And the way it has to be done is this and only this. Those who are chosen are led by the ministers to chairs. Then the priest goes to each with the help of his ministers. He pours water over each one's feet and dries them. It is the priest who washes the feet, not the faithful. It is the priest who washes the feet. And it, is, it has a, a very deep theological meaning, actually. And to, and to understand the theological meaning of the washing of the feet, we have to understand the theology of the gospel according to John. John is always very careful on selecting the words he uses to, to compose the different episodes in his gospel. And the words he chooses normally have a theological meaning. And you will see that, well, first of all, how do I start with this? Because this is so beautiful. When we read the gospel, it says that when the hour of Jesus had come, he loved his disciples to the extreme. 
I am paraphrasing it because I don't recall the, the, the entire text, the exact text in, in English, but that's what it says. When his hour had come, he loved his disciples to the extreme. When his hour had come, his hour for what? His hour to offer himself and die for our salvation. And that's when he loved us to the extreme. And then, right after that happens, he stands up. They are already dining. He stands up, he grabs a bucket of water, and then he takes off his garments and puts them aside. He grabs a towel and he begins washing the feet of his disciples. This is a gesture of him loving his disciples to the extreme. And it was very powerful for them. Why? Well, because according to the tradition, you know, people had to walk in the dust and all that, so they would walk inside the houses with their feet dirty. And back then, it was allowed to have slaves at home, and slaves had different ranks. Well, the slave with the lowest rank was the one responsible for doing what nobody else would want, which was washing the feet of the people who were coming into the house. So what Jesus, who is acknowledged by them, as their master and as their teacher is doing, is shocking to say the least. What is he doing? He shouldn't be doing this. He is our master and he is our Lord. He shouldn't be doing this. So we can see Jesus, first of all, doing and serving his apostles in the lowest possible way known to them, in the most humiliating possible way known to them. And this is only a lesson. And it is a lesson precisely of that extreme love for one another. And later, and later, see, that's what happens. He loves them to the extreme, he washes their feet, and then later in his farewell discourses, he's going to give that commandment of love. Love one another the way I have loved you. How have I loved you? To the extreme. And how does that mean? You have to go and serve each other to the extreme. And to the extreme, up to this point is washing their feet. That extreme. No more, but that low. That extreme. So first of all, it is a teaching for them, very powerful teaching, because then he says, what you have seen me done, you go and do the same. But there is something interesting. When he goes to Peter, when he gets to Peter, and, and John doesn't tell us if Peter was first, if he, if, he, if he was last, or if he was in the middle, he doesn't tell. But what Jesus said is that when he got to Peter, Peter didn't want to let him. He refused to, to let him touch him. No, because you are my master. You cannot do this. And what Jesus tells him is, if you don't let me do this, you cannot take part in my kingdom. This is really interesting because what does washing of the feet, the washing of the feet have to do with being in, the, in his kingdom and being part of his kingdom? Well, Again, we have to pay attention to the words John uses in his gospel. Remember that he describes how Jesus took off his garments and he specifically says that he put them aside. And then when he finishes, he's very careful to mention and to make it specific that he picked up his garment. And those words that, his, that he chose when he wrote his gospel in Greek are used only one more time, referring to Jesus putting his life aside to die and then picking it up to resurrect. So this extreme service of washing the feet of the disciples is a symbol of the extreme service of dying on a cross and then resurrecting. And that's why he tells Peter, if you don't allow me to serve you to the extreme, you cannot take part of my kingdom. Because if you don't allow me to serve you to the extreme, you won't allow me to die on a cross. Because if you don't want to allow me to wash your feet, you are not going to allow me to die on a cross. And if I don't die on a cross for you, then you are not going to be part of my kingdom. So now you see why he, he told this to, to, to Peter. 
So that's why the washing of the feet, the ritual of the washing of the feet has to be performed by the priest. Because in the Mass, it is the priest, the one acting in persona Christi, not the community. And according to the rubrics, what does the priest do? And pay attention to the priest. He's going to take off his chasuble. He's going to take off his, his, uh, his vestments, just like Jesus took off his garment. And he's going to put them aside, like Jesus did, which is a symbol of the death of Jesus. And then when the priest takes his chasuble back and puts it on, that is a symbol of Jesus picking up his life once more when he resurrects. Does it make sense? Isn't this fascinating? Oh, yeah. So that's why, uh, as we go through this, you will be surprised because it is not the same observing what happens than understanding what is going on. And the meaning and the depth it has behind. So this is, this is just amazing. So I told you that these topics are so important that the Missal says that the homily has to cover the three of them, the institution of priesthood, the institution of the Eucharist, and the institution of law. Then, the, 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 the liturgical norms also prescribe that on this Mass, the priest has to consecrate enough hosts for the following day. And why is that? Well, let's wait to, to Good Friday or to Holy Friday and then you will understand why. But for now, just remember that the priest has to consecrate a sufficient number of hosts to be used the following day. After this happens, the priest transfers the Most Blessed Sacrament to a specific place where he is going to be adored through midnight. And that is meant to, to signify that by adoring him through midnight, we are praying with him at Gethsemane. Because that is what Jesus asked his apostles to do. Keep watch. Don't sleep. Keep watch and pray. Keep watch and pray with me so that you don't fall into temptation. And he also wanted the company of them. He wanted to feel the company of them. Because he was afraid. And because he didn't want to die. And because all of a sudden, nothing made sense. He had loved them to the extreme. And the worst he had done so far was washing their dirty feet. But there was something even more extreme that he was supposed to do. And he was in fear, and he was afraid, and he was even sweating blood. According to Luke, he was so stressed that he began sweating blood. He felt nausea. He probably even threw up. Just thinking what was going to happen to him. So we keep watch and we pray with Jesus through midnight, adoring him. <clears throat> and at some point, Jesus will be so afraid that he will be just this bit of dropping everything. And he even makes that prayer, Father, if it is possible, if it is possible, I don't want to drink from this chalice. He even prayed for this not to happen. So afraid he was. And perhaps going through his, through his reflection and thinking, probably at some point he said, what for? What, what's the point of me dying if after all, for ages and ages and ages, people are not going to care. They are just not going to care. Even as we celebrate Holy Week, how many people are taking vacation? Or how many people are working as if it was business as usual, as he's dying for us? So nothing made any sense, and he prayed for this not to happen anymore. But then, then, he remembered, you know, in the worst moments in your life, who do you remember first? Who do you go first when you are in deep trouble? Your best friend? Your mother. 
Your mother. Your mother. Your mother. And if your mother is no longer with you, in the darkest hour, who you think of first? Your mother. So after Jesus prayed for this not to happen anymore, in his darkest moment, he recalled whom? His mother. And he remembered that his mother had taught him how to pray when nothing made any sense. Because his mother knew very well that when nothing makes any sense, pray. the best prayer is to tell the Lord, you will be done, Lord. Jesus learned that prayer from his mother. She said it first. And he definitely made of that his own prayer because when his disciples asked him to teach them how to pray, he taught them what we know as the Our Father. And one of the seven prayers, one of the seven petitions in the Our Father is, your will be done. And Jesus learned that from his mother. And at the darkest moment, he recalls that. And he goes back to his father and says, your will be done. It doesn't make sense, but your will be done. I don't want to, but your will be done. So as we give company to Jesus that night, let's remember all this. Let's remember his suffering. Let's remember his anxiety preoccupation and give company to him and make him feel, you know Lord, I don't know about the rest. I don't know about the rest. But what you are going to do is worth it because of me. Here I am. <coughs> and you can see how this Mass, when it finishes, something dramatic one falls before our eyes. The altar servers leave the altar bare naked. The tabernacle is left empty. The crucifixes and candles are removed because God is about to die. And there is no blessing. At the end of, the, of this Mass, there is no blessing. And many people normally are like, oh, he forgot to give the blessing. No, don't do that. <laughs> there is no blessing for one reason. Yeah. This is not over yet. Remember that on the Triduum we celebrate one single mystery that unfolds in three different moments. But it is not over yet. That's why there is no blessing. Because it is not over yet. So then with this we go into Friday of the Passion of the Lord. This day is the saddest day in the year for the church. It is a day of mourning. And the reason for that is that this is the day the Lord died. When your father dies, you have no mind for any other thing than the passing of your dad. The same with your mom, the same with your, with any beloved person, even with a friend, even with a friend. Back in December, two days before Christmas, my father-in-law passed. And then I came back, after Christmas I came back, and the day after I arrived, one of my best friends passed here too. And I was completely devastated. The world turned upside down to me. I had no mind for anything else. I even got so sick mourning for my friend that there was a time in which I had by medical prescription to turn off my phone, to turn off my computer, to ignore absolutely everybody, even my closest friends. Because I could not take one more call to explain what had happened, to tell them at what time the funeral was. I was just, my life was broken into pieces. And all of us have lost somebody and to know how that feels.
deals. Well, what is happening on Good Friday is the same, but more important because the one who is dying is the one who has loved us the most. And the one who we are supposed to love the most, even by commandment, even by commandment. We have to love God above anything that exists. So for that reason, this is, this is the saddest day in, in, the, in the church. And it is sad to the point that it is the only day in which we don't have the celebration of the Holy Mass. There is no Mass on Good Friday. Just as there are no sacraments on Good Friday, only penance and the anointment of the sick, especially if you are in peril of death. But there are no baptisms, there are no matrimonies, there are no ordinations, there are no confirmations, there is no Mass. And why there is no Mass? Because there is no God. Where is God? God is dead. God is dead. So for that reason, and as an expression of our mourning on Good Friday, we fast and we abstain from eating meat. Many people wonder about abstinence. Why should I refrain from, right? Well, it's simple. Just keep this in mind. No beef, no poultry, no pork, no lamb. And sometimes the, the, the question is, okay, I am not supposed to eat red meat, but chicken is kind of white. <laughs> well, no, it, it is white, it's red, you're not supposed to. So probably the question is not what kind of meat it is, but what kind of blood it is. So if it is a warm-blooded animal, you cannot consume it. If it is a cold-blooded animal, then you can. But it is also a day of fasting. The rule for fasting is that this is the, the minimum requirement. This is, this, is, this is the prescription of the church. The prescription is to eat one full meal only and two lighter meals than you normally do and nothing in between. That is what the church prescribes. But of course you can do something else, right? So, something very common is to only have bread and water through the day. Bread and water, right? Another thing is to have no supper at all. Some people go beyond and they don't eat anything at all, they only drink water for a day. Whatever you do, the purpose is for you, yeah, to suffer, to, to feel that, that suffering, because in a way we want to share the suffering of Jesus who is suffering for us. So why not sharing at least a bit of his suffering, right? But also that makes us, that lack of food makes us feel weak. And that weakness reminds us that we, don't, we do not depend on ourselves alone. That makes us feel that we depend on God. But guess what? There is no God, because God is dead. That's important of this. Now, from a liturgical standpoint, what happens on Good Friday? Well, first of all, a tradition of the church is to celebrate the Tenebre. The Tenebre is, if you're familiar with the Liturgy of the Hours, the morning prayer, the loudest, that is celebrated in the darkness, in Good Friday, and that is why it is called the Tenebre. Here in Seattle, I only know of two places where you can participate on the Tenebre, the Cathedral and Blessed Sacrament with the Dominicans. As far as I know, those are the two only places in Seattle where you can celebrate the Tenebre. I strongly encourage you to do that because again, Good Friday should be fully reserved to the Lord and to the Lord alone. There's too much traffic. Yeah, there's too much traffic to go to work, so forget the traffic. Offer it as a sacrifice and go to the cathedral and, and take part of this. It is important. It is God dying for us. Jesus dying for us. Another, another common tradition is the celebration of the, of the, of the stations of the cross. And when they are solemn stations of the cross, even better. Uh, something that they also love since I was a kid was coming back home from the stations of the cross at the church. And, and I always ran upstairs and turned on the TV to watch the stations of the cross from Rome with the Pope around the Coliseum. And I grew doing that following Pope John Paul. And then here at home, uh, I, I, I did that for many years with Pope Benedict with my two kids, and now, of course, we do it with Pope Francis. And the, the, the beauty now of the internet is that you don't have to, to watch it live or you miss it. You can tune it whenever you want in, in, in YouTube, in the Vatican channel, and, and you can see it, and it is in English, and it is in Spanish, and it is in Italian, and the raw uh, uh, soundtrack and all that, so 
do it. It, it is beautiful to, to watch this. It is a very powerful experience. Now, something that is also very common, especially in other countries, but also in some, some other places here, um, is to turn the Stations of the Cross into what is called the Treore. Three hours, because Jesus was in Calvary crucified three hours before he died. So what happens is that following the Stations of the Cross, there is a meditation on the seven last words of Jesus from the cross. As far as I know, here in Seattle, there are only three places where you can attend the meditation on the seven last words of Jesus from the cross. Blessed Sacrament with the Dominicans, the Cathedral, and St. Monica Parish with yours truly. So, if you go to St. Monica this Good Friday, the, the Stations of the Cross will begin at 12 o'clock, and the moment they finish, I will begin leading a meditation on the seven last words of Jesus. If you cannot make it, there are some CDs, both in English and in Spanish, of, of previous meditations that I did, and I also have books in English and in Spanish of previous meditations that I did, so you can, you can, uh, you can get a copy and you can do that exercise at home. But I would love to see you there. It is going to be a beautiful experience. I have been doing this for seven years now, and, and people love it because it's a very powerful experience. So with this, why don't we take a break? Uh, there is water, there is food, and once again, there are plenty of books and CDs. Let's take a break, but please don't go because the best is yet to come. And I promise the best is yet to come for sure. Let's take a break. Okay. <laughs>